welcome to Building a Better South Africa Together, a web series that takes a look at solutions to deal with the challenges that we sometimes face here in South Africa. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to be spending time speaking to members from civil society, from the business community, government as well. And we're really going to be focusing on what is hampering our growth. So we know that crime and corruption, energy challenges, rebuilding road and rail infrastructure are going to help move us to a place where we have bigger economic growth, where we see more investment and more jobs in South Africa so that we can really enjoy the country that we live in and most of us can do that. So last week we spoke to Richard Price, who is the Legal and Corporate Affairs Director at Anglo-American, about the rule of law. But what do you and I need to do in order to see the South Africa that we want? What power do we have? Joining me for this conversation is Mbali Nduli. She's the founder of Groundwork Collective. Mbali, thank you so much for your time on Building a Better South Africa Together. Just talk to me about the election next year. Although it's a little bit far away, it's really getting people excited or people talking. What do people have to do to participate in our democracy? I think we're in a very pivotal moment uh, when it comes to 2024 in our country. It's going to be 30 years of democracy, and I think that trends show, particularly in Africa, that once liberation movements and liberation and liberated countries get to 30 years, there's really two ways that they go. Either democracy really matures and you see it being entrenched and you see citizens being far more active, or it goes the way that we've seen and some of the counterparts are now brothers and sisters across the continent where democracy becomes a failed project. And I think for 2024 in South Africa, this is going to be our reckoning moment because looking at how many things are happening in both our political and socioeconomic outlooks, but also then looking at the fact that we don't have citizens that are really taking their power back and are really... Uh, participating in the way that they should to ensure that our democracy matures and deepens. I think we're in for a 2024 election that's going to be interesting in mm. every single aspect. Mm. When you say people should be participating in democracy, mm. what do you mean? How should we be doing that? So I think for a long time we really outsourced a lot of our political civic education to political parties and also expected that the IEC or civil society would pick up the slack. And what that did was it meant that citizens themselves weren't really get, being informed. We don't even have that as part of our curriculum. And basically, we now sit with a position where we have less than half the people who were eligible to vote in our last election who actually came out to vote. Mm -hmm. We have a voter's role that is dying, immigrating, and aging out. And what we don't have is the replenishment of that voter's role with new citizens who actually understand the efficacy between not just voting, but then in between elections, also being able to hold political parties and political players accountable to make sure that we have this thriving democracy that we want. Democracy is a group project. It's something that we all have to be involved in or it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. And we unfortunately are not like other countries where there's mandatory voting and so staying at home means that you've taken a conscientious decision to abstain. In this case, if you don't go out and actually participate, then it actually doesn't make a difference because those less than half a million or less than half the citizens that are eligible to vote who did vote would have made the choice and you will have to bear the brunt of it. And so mm -hmm. I think one of the great things that we can do going forward in this election is really get behind a renewed focus on civic education. The average South African doesn't understand that they can actually make sure that they can sit on their ward committees, make contributions to what money is going to go into them. People complain about water pipes being bursting outside their homes or street lights. There's money that's allocated for that, but people haven't drawn the conclusion between even when their council meetings are. There are very small steps that we could be taking as citizens to really actually make sure that our democracy is better. And mm -hmm. we have one of the most participatory democracies in the world, and we really haven't gotten to the stage where citizens themselves feel empowered to do something. And so we constantly then have this distrust of political players, but also be unsure what else we can do about it. I think the average South African is very patriotic and they want to get stuck in and involved. I think it's now up to us to all actually show them what these different ways are, because then I think mm. you'll see people really coming to the fore and being inspired to get involved in their communities far more. Okay, you spoke about the voters' role uh, and how it's being depleted, but then it's not uh, being filled up with those younger voters. What's the importance of young people in particular mm. participating in democracy, voting as well, and how do you do that? <laughs> it's a question for the ages. <laughs> 
So yes, our voters' role is depleting. We currently have 14 million eligible and perhaps even 15 million once the census data comes out to show us people that could still vote. Of that, about 5 million of them are people that are between 18 and 35. And a lot of research shows that if you can get a young voter to get into the cycle of voting, into the cycle of participation, they are more likely to be lifelong voters. If, however, you leave them out of that loop, it's very, very difficult to get them back when they are 27 or 35 to come back. So it's incumbent on us because it might not seem as a catastrophe right now, but in five years' time, when those voters are mature, when those voters are people that may have bonds or may be unemployed or may be looking for ways in which to actually actively participate, we're not going to be able to have them in the system to make the kind of choices that they need to make to change whatever the circumstances that they are. So we're sitting on a time bomb that doesn't seem for most people as though it's serious because so many people do vote. But what it actually means is that in the future, we're going to have less people that vote. And this is great for political parties, by the way. They don't really need more people to be out there and voting. They know who their voters are, and they can get those people out. And if everyone else stays at home, mm -hmm. even better. So what we need to do is we need to actually make voting exciting and sexy and something that young people can be interested in. Like any other individual, they need to see a return on investment for them. And because it's not something that's immediate, you have to do it in ways that I think speak to the youth in mediums that speak to the youth. And I think we've seen globally that young people are incentivized when you have some kind of voting behavior, some sort of incentive-based um, way of getting them to the polls. And so we should be using music. We should be using, uh, you know, our corporate sponsors to give, you know, prizes and incentives to get young people to actually understand what's happening. And not just in terms of making them incentivized to come out, but then to link it to the civic education, because you also don't want to just register people and make them voting fodder for any old mm -hmm. populace that might come along. You want to then absolutely empower them with the civic education so that they're not susceptible to disinformation, so that they know what they're even looking for when you say go vote for a ward councillor. They should know what that ward councillor should be able to do and what kind of characteristics that they should have. And so we can't really also be angry at the fact that we have so many people that have checked out of the system because we haven't done enough work to make sure that they understand how the entire process works and, quite frankly, what's in it for them. And it might seem obvious to some people that the fact that you might not have a job as a young person is linked to the political crisis we might be in, but that's not always obvious when the person that's a ward councillor in your community is not necessarily the person that's going to give you the job. And so we need to start really from the basics. How is the president elected? Does the health minister need to be a doctor? How does this affect you in your everyday life? That's the kind of civics that we need to be bringing in. What happens at a UIP? Can you go to parliament and sit there as an ordinary citizen? These are all things that are widely available in our legislation and our act. But honestly, because people are so overwhelmed with everything that happens in our country, you need a package in a way that is easy for young mm -hmm. people to digest. Mm -hmm. You've spoken about people uh, not going out to vote. Anecdotally, uh, you hear people saying, I'm actually not going to vote because it's not going to make a difference. And we're probably going to hear this rhetoric ramping up as we go towards elections. Does South Africa have a voter apathy issue? Not at all. I, I think that we are disillusioned. And I think that we are incredibly disappointed by what we thought our democracy would look like 30 years on mm -hmm. that hasn't come to fruition for the majority of people. And just, again, to use the youth as a reference point, if somebody is 30 now, uh, they have known their entire lives the rhetoric that they might not have a job after they matriculate or they graduate. So that's not something that is um, still a promise. It's something that they lived in daily reality. They probably know most of their friends don't have jobs and they might be the only like one or they themselves might not have jobs. If they've been alive since 2008, they've only ever known that this country has been involved in load shedding, for example. So there's, um, there's a lot that we have to do, but we have 26 protests every single day. That's not a sign of apathy. That's a sign of people who still deeply care about wanting someone to answer the calls that they have. They just haven't, I think, felt that democracy and elections necessarily are that way. And Afrobarometer says 72% of the survey people that they surveyed earlier this year said that they would give up democracy and elections if they could have a political party that would give them a job or uh, security or housing. And that should concern us because mm -hmm. what that says is that one, our civic education is really low across the board. And two, again, if you don't make sure that that is something that we quickly make sure that young people are 
um, empowered with, and not just young people, but everyone, then you actually start having a situation where you might have somebody who comes along and speaks really well and says he can do or she can do a lot of things for these young people. And then they believe them because we haven't empowered them by giving them the ideas that, for example, you can't just wake up and say you're going to have an economy that gives every single person a job tomorrow. We'd like that, but that's just not how things work. But if you haven't actually made the hard work now that we have to do as our democracy um, matures to making sure that everyone understands that, then we shouldn't be surprised in a couple mm. of years time where we see a large swell of people, particularly young people who will vote for the first person who can offer them what they haven't seen in the last 30 years. So we have a lot mm. of work ahead of us. Mm. Tell me about civic education more and the work that you do. And I mean, we, when we speak about educating people, sometimes it can come across as being condescending, mm. but you're not saying there's a certain group of people. You're saying across the board, mm. we need to be more aware of what's happening. A hundred percent. And I mean, I've been using the example of young people, but there's a lot of people who are beyond the youth category in our country that also uh, don't know a lot of this information. There's people who are CEOs that don't know this uh, conversation. So it's not a moral judgment. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we all have to take on board, that we've all let ourselves down as a country by not insisting that it should have been done. But we have the moment now and certainly going towards 2024 while there's so much excitement around what this election means, particularly because young people are saying, you know, 2024 is their 1994, we have a great opportunity to actually start the civics. And so for us uh, and the work that we do at Groundwork Collective, we've been going out and registering young people in places where they are using influences and people that they find really interesting to spread that kind of message because you also want it to be relevant to them. We use music, we use concerts, and then within this, we weave in the civics education toolkit, and that's really videos and animations and board games, you know, according to the level of the person that you're speaking to. So in high school, you want to give them a board game about what the civics is. And in that way, you actually are giving people the information without being boring and feeling like you're lecturing them or teaching them. And once people understand that something as simple as the fact that, I mean, the IEC's second biggest election outside of the normal elections is the SGB. Every single person who's a parent should know that if their child goes to a government or a public school, that they have the ability to actually make input into policy. But people don't really draw together the fact that the SGB is happening, you can have a voice there, and there's stuff that you can get done. Alternatively, for the crime that's in your area, the CPF, the War Committee, I don't think that the average South Africa has been exposed as much as we think to these particular things. And it's not something that should be difficult for us to get out there. And that's what we've been doing in Cloudwork Collective. And once people actually understand what it is that they can do, what you can do if your ward councillor doesn't actually speak to you or won't respond to you, then you've taken the, pa the, 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 the power even out of political parties because you've empowered the person to be able to do something on their own. Mm. And that's where we want to move to. We want to move to a society that has citizens that are engaged, that can keep people accountable, but more importantly, that can then feel that if somebody is not accountable, they can change it. And they don't have to sit with this disillusionment and this distrust and this uh, sort of hopelessness that we sometimes feel in South Africa. Mm. And I think it's important because it speaks to the fact that everyone living in South Africa can really build together to see the South Africa that we want to see. Uh, everyone has some sort of power, uh, even if it's not political, because often a conflation between political power and just power in general. 100%. And I mean, stats they say, I think, says there's something like 2.5 um, people on average in every household that have not been, for example, registered. So that might, you might be registered, but you might have a niece or a son or a daughter or somebody. And, and these are the messages that we can have around, you know, the bribe when we're talking about the spring box. Hey, have you registered to vote? You might be surprised to hear that many of the corporate companies also have a lot of young people in their workforce that have not registered. So that's another opportunity mm. that, you know, people can have this message, they can have open days, they can have a number of fun ways that we can make democracy interesting. And I think that that's going to be what's going to change the tide, not mm. us fighting about political ideology and, you know, the, the scandal of the day. We need to actually start speaking about the solutions. And this is one of the great ones, because again, if you have a voters roll, say, of 15 million, and certain political parties know what they get from that, 10 million here, 2 million here, the rest of the remainder of small parties. Imagine in the next election you've added another 6 million. That means that you've 
dramatically changed what the electoral outcome had come. And just by getting people to register and then actually go out and vote on the day. That's mm. how easy it is. It's simple numbers and everyone can get involved because I think that we all are patriotic and we all actually want to see our country doing better. Mm -hmm. And so with that, staying with that, I think most of us have a vision for a South Africa that's prosperous, a uh, vision for South Africa no matter what you look like, mm. that you are able to succeed and you don't have the barriers that are in place now. What's a South Africa that you want to see and that you want people to help come together and build together? I think for me, the kind of South Africa that you described is great, but also... I really wish that we had a South Africa that really spoke to everyone being able to realize their full potential by having the opportunities to pursue them. And I think it's incredibly sad that we have a situation where now we have people who from the ages of 18 after they received potentially a grant to the rest of their lives might not never have a permanent job might never have the opportunity to really show what is inside of them and what they have to offer. And I think having the policy discussions that we have about malnutrition and education and all these different things that affect us are great. But I wish that policy in our country also centered on the individual and what they have to offer and how you could unlock those barriers. Because I think that once people could be self-actualized in South Africa in any form, you'd have a lot more people buying in and being able to pull towards the same thing. And what's been really great is to see finally uh, civil society coming together to say that they want to work together instead of the silos that we've seen. Corporates doing the same thing, particularly with this wonderful pledge that has been signed now, um, as well as political parties and political actors. And I think once you have that triangle and you have the convergence of having the balancing of each of these particular sectors of society towards and against one another, then you have a South Africa that despite whatever problems you might go and face in the future is one where at least we know we're all pulling in the same direction. Mm. So for me, really, I think that we have a great opportunity to to really do a South Africa 2.0, start it over in, uh, in our 30 years of democracy um, and forge a new path of where we want to go now. We're mm. no longer a kid or a teenager. We have now reached our adulthood as a mm. country. Mm. It's a very South African thing, though, uh, despite our challenges to just go, this is what we need to do. We're going to come together. We're going to fix these issues that we're dealing with and get on with it. I think so. And I think we're very resilient. Maybe sometimes a little bit too resilient. <laughs> we're tired. Um, I think at some stage, like we, we've really got to consider that we're going to reach a breaking point of, you know, trying to work our way around issues that mm. happen. Uh, we're so accustomed to things like load shedding, for example, that they no longer really bother us. But it is a South African thing. We're really great at making plans. Best country in the world in terms of our constitution, which really is a declaration of what this nation was going to be about. I don't think there's another constitution in the world that gives the promises in the way that our constitution goes about shelter and water to the degree that it has. Um, and I think that it's, it speaks highly of what we imagined. And I think that we have a lot of work to do to also honor the people that have come before us. And our generation in particular have to take that mantle forward now because this is where we are. Um, but we've never been bad at planning in South Africa. We're not so great at implementing in every single way. And hopefully that's something that we can break. And I suppose with the, that triangle that you spoke about, that's where the implementation is set to work because you have people working together, bringing their different expertise together. A hundred percent. I think for a long time we've had each you know, civil society with politics or politics with business. Once we could have the triangle together, I think we would really see something special coming out of that in South Africa. And in a way that's more than just you know, sort of corporate CSI, where we all go and paint a, a house or a, a school for a day, to really get stuck into what our country needs. And a lot of that is around some of the stuff that is only going to be long term in terms of what we see um, the results in things like civic education. A person's not going to necessarily, because they've had civic education en masse in next year's election, completely change things. But in five years, in 10 years, that's when you reap the rewards of what you would have sown. But we have to start it now. Valin Dooley, the founder of Groundwork Collective, thank you so much for your time on building a better South Africa together. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you for having me too.
All right, so we've spoken about the power that you and I have when it comes to building a better South Africa together. One of the challenges that's been brought up in a lot of the conversations that we've been having over the last few weeks is energy. Next week, we're going to focus on the challenges and the solutions to stay with us and build a better South Africa together.